don't want to do too much in case my cargo change. We're not actually recording it. Anyways, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I, I I designed what I could, but I was waiting on buying the hardware, and then I bought the hardware and then I redesigned a bit, and then I realized, well, I don't know exactly like down to the like, yes, I can measure, but also my house is old. Nothing on it is exactly straight or lined up. So I don't know. I mean, the the distance between effective points for what do you call it? Like a bend or whatnot, or basically two inches, inch and a half maybe on the strip. So I don't know, like, is that going to be 14 or 15 or 16 LEDs in that or pixels in that segment? I don't know until I get it on the house. Um, so yeah, basically once it was all mounted, uh, if I were doing this again, I would probably test everything on the ground after having measured it. Well, I'd test everything, measure, you know, build it all out, put it on the house and then do all the software side of things. Um, but that's not what I did. Uh, so I iterated. One of the big things was more power. Um, I am now injecting every 100 pixels, which is much as I can do without cutting open the strips. And it still doesn't have enough power for what I want to do, but that's okay. I'm sure the neighbors don't need it any brighter than the 65% I'm already at. A lot of people that do these displays will set the brightness between 15 and 35%. Um, one of my sort of mentors for this project was insisting that if I go above 30%, I'm insane. Um, I tried it at 80% for a while, but I ran into too many issues. So I set it on 65%, which is I, I was able to push 75 without too many issues, but I do value stability. So I kept it at 65, which is still more than double his recommendation. Anyhow, um, lots of cussing. Uh, stuff goes wrong and I cuss a lot. So that's definitely part of my process. Uh, you can see that one of the things here in the image, uh, well, both of these images uh, were the result of a process that involved cussing. So one of them, I needed to solder something up in the air on a ladder. And you can see my soldering iron sort of balanced on the front door and the ladder uh, as I did that. Um, also, the other one is actually a screenshot from a video I, saved, I made for myself so that I could remember how to program the dang controller. Um, because you actually need to short one of the pins to ground to get it into like boot enable mode and use, even though you can power it with five volts and that's recommended for operation, when you're programming, you need to power it with 3.3 volts and like there were some, but then if you do that, then you can't like test, I don't know, there were a bunch of weird stuff. So I made a video to myself so that I didn't have to try and remember it. Um, hardware, sort of the initial testing and figuring out, right? Uh, breadboard. I use breadboard. Uh, one of the one of the people on Slack was like, "Yeah, hey, I want to know about the hardware. We're more than the software." So that's that's why I'm touching on a lot more of this stuff. Um, although I, I promise we'll get to the Linuxy side here a little bit. So one of the things with the breadboard is that you can sometimes program it in circuit, make changes like that. But sometimes you can't because you know if you're supposed to pull this thing to the ground, but it has an internal pull flip resistor uh, or you're putting an external resistor that's effectively active with a flip resistor because it's in your breadboard, then you can run into some issues. And depending on how sensitive your stuff is to data reflections, you could have stray bits of electricity reflecting off of wires and other things. And it can just, it can be a nightmare, but it can also be really useful. Um, one of the things to note here is on the WT32ETH01, uh, the model that I bought initially shown on the right, after some slight modifications, uh, has the headers mounted on the wrong side if you intend to use a motherboard or anything that resembles a motherboard because of the ethernet jack, which is like primary feature of this anyhow. Um, if you go on Amazon, there's a specific vendor called Jacob's Parts uh, that is very, very proud that they now ship the headers separately because they got so many one-star reviews from people uh, after they mounted them on the wrong side. Um, and instead of just mounting them on the other side, they're like, you know what? We thought this was the right way, you can pick now. Um, and the second batch that I got was actually intentionally unpopulated, even though not from that vendor because they were out of stock at the time. Uh, and to desolder these, I could not desolder the batch at once. I had to cut all the joints and then desolder them one by one because I apparently I'm not that skilled. Um, but yeah, so if you are looking to do this, uh, make sure you get one with the headers on the bottom or depopulated and solder them yourself. Um, that is a solderable breadboard. 
it is my current preferred method because I can make it somewhat modular. There's WT32HH01, a generic bidirectional logic level shifter, and a regulator that I am using for 5 volt regulation to step down from 12 volt to 5 volt. Um, the blue thing is the uh, logic level shifter. The green thing is the, uh, the bidirectional red solderable breadboard. Anyhow, the lights, uh, they are addressable. Mine specifically in banks of three, which I know sounds confusing because you're like, well, it's RGB. Isn't it already banked? No, 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 no. Three RGB LEDs. So the red channel on three go together. The blue channel on three of them go together and the green channel on three go together. And that is, uh, from a software perspective, considered a pixel. This pixel just happens to be made up of three points of light coming from three different RGB LEDs. Uh, obviously, there's RGB support. Uh, it's a very, very rudimentary protocol, uh, which is fast enough for persistence vision type stuff, you know, where you can you can uh, do do little spinny things and whatnot, and kind of kind of catch and whatnot, or you know, make it look like it's like it's fading and whatnot. But it's just Barely. Um, also, the protocol is effectively uh, the same style as a, uh, what do you call it, shifter, the shifter circuit things. I'm drawing a blank on it, uh, like a, a, an address shift doohickey. Basically, what it does is uh, each chip reads the data coming in. The first packet, it takes uh, from it, so ask how it doubles buffers. Uh, is that what that says? Uh, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. I was just wondering if it double buffered like you do with a lot of video stuff. No, it, there, there's zero buffer. Uh, not even, not even single buffer. Uh, so it, the way that it works is each chip, and there's, there's the timing and all that. The, the protocol, if you go look up WS2811 protocol, there's like a whole document from Adafruit about it. Um, and basically what it does is it looks at the data coming in and between streams, right? So for each, for each chunk where all you, that you send it down on the lights, it's similar to DMX uh, in that regard that you just kind of send out a burst of data and then you send out another burst of data and you do that at regular intervals. Um, it looks at the burst of data, it looks at the first uh, chunk and it says, hey, this is mine. And it sets that LED to those values. And then everything else that gets in that chunk it just hands down the line. And the next chip does the same thing. Uh, so effectively, the first chunk of data you send goes to the first pixel, the second one goes to the second pixel, because each of them are doing the exact same thing, where it's, you know, take take one down, pass it around. It doesn't care if you have extra... It just, yeah, it doesn't care. If it, just fall off. it just, the stuff falls off at the end. So, uh, and if you, uh, one of the one of the common things is that the typical pixel count, I believe, on WLED is 50 by default. So if you try and plug in 100 LED strip, only the first 50 light up. Because the last one says, oh, the first thing, that's for me. And then there's nothing else. So it doesn't chuck anything down the line. Um, but yeah, so there, and there are some other interesting things about it, but I, I'm not getting into all that right now. So Tasmoda, um, this is an open source doohickey that is a custom firmware for ESP devices, uh, especially the 8266 series. <clears throat> this is my uh, Sonoff IT uh, relay. Um, deal that I flashed with Tesmoda just the other day. I had a lot of trouble getting it to work. Uh, Tesmoda sucks. Uh, but you know what? It doesn't suck as bad as the default firmware. So there is that. Um, also, once it's running and it actually connects to Wi-Fi for the first time, which is the big challenge. So one, one thing with these boards is that the, the way that the button is uh, can be difficult. And sometimes you actually need to hold down the button for the entire programming process even though it's just supposed to be on boot. Uh, one of my two devices, I actually had to hold it down the whole time, or if I let go of it, it would stop programming. Uh, the other one didn't seem to care. This is the one that didn't seem to care, but this one also had more trouble connecting to Wi-Fi. Uh, who knows? Uh, but this is how I power on and off my FM transmitter so that I'm not stepping on a mostly empty frequency um, that is currently undisclosed um, when I'm when I don't need it. So uh, automation, uh, I have cron to power on and off the FM tra transmitter uh, using the screenshots you see here. A very, very, very simple curl script only because uh, 
Perl hates me whenever I try and throw in parameters, no matter how much I try and escape them and learn cron and read about it, I always end up just throwing it in a scripting, it's basically one line of actual executable code and calling it good. Uh, this is running on a Ubuntu 2204 laptop, basically sitting in a corner uh, using XLite scheduler. So XLite has like three auxiliary programs that do different things. One of them is a scheduler that you can say like, here's a playlist and here's the se sequence with the song and here's the times that you play it at and that sort of thing. So I have that set up to uh, play the song at the time specified with you know the lights and music and all that good stuff. Um, and then afterwards at like nine something at night, it turns to just sort of a greenish white for the rest of the night until 8 a.m. and then it turns off because why, why use LEDs and power if you're not gonna be paying attention to it anyway. Um, and then I think, my clicker work, there we go. Excellent. This is where the magic happens. Uh, this is, you You could do an entire presentation on Excellence. In fact, you could do an entire presentation on every module of Excellence. Um, and there are people that have. There are dozens of hours of video um, that I attempted to skim through and rip out relevant parts and attempting to figure out how to use this monstrosity. Um, the biggest criticisms are that the way that the like window decoration stuff presents itself is just atrocious and it's hard to get anything super useful out of it. Um, and that basically none of it is very intuitive. I have used a couple other sequencing softwares before and thought both of them were uh, better from a functional standpoint, but none of them can touch X lights uh, in terms of the, the power and flexibility it has. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. Uh, like I said, this is, this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, the screenshot is a, a sort of snapshot of what it looks like uh, when I have my sequence pulled up under the sequence tab. Uh, I didn't include anything about the layout in the controllers since that'll be different if you're doing it anyway. But the layout, you can have something that very looks very, very similar to this. You can see the house preview, which does include a picture of my house, but it's just set brightness like 10% or something, so you can barely see it. And then those random stray little white lines off to the side um, I am using what are sometimes known as hot corners, where if I need to turn a corner with the LED tape, I don't cut the tape and then solder it. I just leave a few extra pixels in there and make the jump. Uh, but then I don't want those pixels to be showing. So I have them off to the side in their own little group and just never turn them on when my full sequence. Uh, so you, you never see them and it works great. And that's also why I have a schedule for turning on the lights rather than just having X light stop sending data and then WLED takeover because WLED can do effects and stuff too. Um, but WLED will just turn all of them on because I didn't bother setting up anyhow. Long story. Uh, but yeah, so that's X lights. Uh, that covers most of the, the software side of things. Soldering uh, was a big part. Uh, lots, lots and lots of soldering. Uh, waterproof strips do not equal waterproof connectors for whatever stupid reason. Um, waterproof connectors are a somewhat standard thing on some strips. Uh, and I believe you can even get them on non-waterproof, you can get waterproof connectors on non-waterproof strips, and I don't understand that, but whatever. What's even more dumb is the, the highest level of waterproofing available for these, which is technically rated at IP67. Don't know if I would actually trust it submerged, whatever. Um, they come with these plastic connectors seen in the left image, which are very much not waterproof. Um, I did not re-solder the ones already mounted to the house. I just gobbed up a bunch of silicon dielectric and plugged it in and called it good. Uh, it worked when I tested it in the summer with a bunch of rain. So we'll see what Snowmageddon does to it. Uh, <laughs> might find out when I get home that that was the wrong decision. Um, also, uh, another reference to that cussing I mentioned earlier, if you look at the right image, you can see that I was too distracted taking pictures and I'm actually wiring the data line to the ground line. Um, so after I took this picture, I soldered it and then cussed and then unsoldered it and did it the right way. Um, because yeah, also why does the manufacturer produce LED tape with white as ground and connectors with black as ground and the data is yellow versus green, but red is still red, I may never know. Um, but that's, these are from the same manufacturer. So I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the end result is that I uh, got everything mapped in X-Lite, sort of what goes where and what it does and yada, yada. 
gut sequence. They got what they call power injection. I put that in quotes because I hate that term. <laughs> like, like it feels like, oh, I'm injecting. No, that's what you call static electricity. This is just providing an additional bus bar location effectively. Um, so what happens is the uh, strips, the, what do you call it? The traces and the flexible PCB uh, have a fair bit of resistance. So over the course of the 16 feet that they are along, or more if you chain them together, uh, there's a fair bit of voltage drop that can affect data because again, it's a very rudimentary protocol that just references power and ground. Um, and you know, between those two, so if you're sagging power and your data is sagging at a different rate than your voltage, then it's, it's just it's just a mess. Um, so the power injection as it is, is effectively just a power cable that runs straight from the power supply to the end of the chain or the middle of the chain somewhere and provides it uh, you know, with another path for electricity. So you're, you're keeping the overall voltage a little bit higher. Um, this is also showing the mounted in aluminum channel with diffusers installed over top. They come with the aluminum channel. Uh, pro tip though, so there's IP, what is it? Not IP rated, like IP30 or something. That's like indoor use, basically just bare PCB with, with lights on top. You can pick at with your finger. Uh, like a fidget spinner when you're bored and then they pop off and then it doesn't work. Um, they also make the IP65 stuff, which is basically that same stuff, but then they run like a really fancy hot glue gun over it with silicon and it makes like a little dome shape on it. Um, that's what most people use. That comes with a adhesive tape backing. You put it on the channel, super easy to work with. I said, no, I want, I want those extra two ratings on that second digit in my IP. Um, so what mine is, is it's effectively a silicon tube that has no adhesive backing. And the reason is that you can't put double stick tape to it. It doesn't stick because it's silicon. Um, I've tried, I talked with people that knew what they were doing and they're like, yeah, I just used this special foam tape. So I bought a roll of it. It also didn't stick. Um, that was when I stopped asking around LED people because all the LED people just say, well, don't use strips outside. You should use pencils outside. I'm like, I don't want to use pictures, I don't use strips. So uh, yeah, they're really opinionated and they know what they're talking about, but they don't know chemistry. So I started looking up some chemistry info about silicon and how you would get an adhesive to stick to it. And what I found was use silicon adhesive uh, and that worked great. So I found some GE silicon glue, uh, put it in the aluminum channel, just dot, 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 dot every so often, stick it in, wait at least a couple hours and it's enough to, to move it gently without it falling and after, 24 hours or so, it's 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 in there. Like you can pull it out if you really want to, but it's not going to fall out on its own. Uh, again, we'll see what Snowman Geddon does to it, but uh, so far it's been pretty solid. So, pro tip there. Uh, any questions at the moment? I'll open up to questions. I think I updated that QR code. It should go to that URL scene. Uh, that's a, a public link to this presentation if you want it. Uh, but yeah, any questions about any of that? The video. Yeah, we're, we're, I I don't have a video to uh, see the front side of the house. Uh, if you go to lightshow.geek.us, that is my official um, status tracker in all things. Someone wants to put that in the, the chat too for those that may come later. Let me see if I can get. Suppose I can stop. That's I can stop Google sharing. Doc. It is a Google Doc. That is my, that is my, because it's really easy to update if I need to. I don't have to dive into HTML. Um, where is my Zoom? Okay, I got it. It's being recorded. Where's my chat? There's my chat. There we go. Uh, Dan is asking, what is the URL? Yeah, there it is. There's, there's the URL. So 9 p.m. Is it playing right now? It should be. Um, do you have any outside ZM cameras we can um, see it with? Well, yes and no a little bit. So I'm just going to put my white so, camera. So noted is the blue house, not the yellow house. Yeah, because uh, there is an eighth place and there has been recent confusion. Um, apparently the people at eighth place are selling their house. <laughs> and I had people trying to get into my house thinking it was that house. And yeah, so 
Uh, yeah, so, uh, Dan, that URL is, uh, should redirect you to the Google Doc. And if I ever need to change the Google Doc address, I'll just update that, that redirect point to I, the new. I think he was asking for the uh, slide deck. Oh, uh, let me see. Oh, and we have someone who's joining. Oh, hey, talking. How can how you pronounce it? Hello, Hello. I'm so Hi. sorry. I had a job interview earlier tonight and oh, I got no distracted afterwards. No so late. As sorry about that. I can go ahead and hit stop here. Okay, it should be. I think that's the link for.